Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to have Craig Bewick uh, joining us today. Craig is a Senior Director of Client Development and Sales at the CME Group, and uh, he will be presenting an introduction to Micro Treasury Yield Futures, which is a new contract or new contracts that the CME Group has only just launched a few weeks ago. So before we get started with Craig's presentation, we would like to talk about how the CME Group and Tradebate work together. While today's webinar focuses on these new micro treasuries at the CME, the CME Group offers a wide range of products that are available on Tradebate, including many micro contracts as well, such as the micro indices, currencies, oil, and gold. And we would encourage you to check out the CME Resource Center on the Tradebate website under the Knowledge tab. At the CME Resource Center, you can find heat maps, trading insights, and more. And we also encourage you to visit the CME Group's website at cmegroup.com for a wealth of information on trading futures. Right, before we get started, let's go over the standard disclaimer. Brokerage services are provided by Trade of Eight, and Trade of Eight is a member of the NFA and registered with the CFTC. This is not an offer or a solicitation for brokerage services or other products or services in any jurisdiction where Tradebate is not authorized to do business or where such offer or solicitation would be contrary to local laws and regulations of that jurisdiction. Futures and options of trading involves a substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Investors should understand the risk involved in trading and carefully consider whether such trading is suitable in the light of their financial circumstances and resources. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, well, after the presentation, we will open up for questions and uh, you can submit those in advance and we will um, go through some of them as well during the presentation and any that we don't answer, we can go through at the end. And uh, John is also here from the CME, so uh, Craig and John will be uh, will be doing this today. Uh, thank you both for for doing this, and uh, Craig, I will pass it on to you. You can go ahead and share your screen. Great, thanks, Fashion. Let me uh, just share my screen real quick here, and hopefully, yep. uh, my that looks good. Up. Great. Yep. Okay, great. So. Again, thanks for that introduction. And, and on behalf of CME Group, I'd, I'd like to thank Trade of Eight, not just for today's webinar, but, but really for being an, an important partner to CME Group over actually quite a number of years, but in particular over the last couple of, year, of years. I know Fashion mentioned that my colleague, John Bree, is on the line, and, and he and, and Rick and Rick's team at Trade of Eight have done a lot of work together in educating the trading public on CME Group futures and options. And, you know, in, in what I hope you know, for Trade of Eight, because I know it's been a valuable uh, relationship for CME has been a mutually beneficial one. So we appreciate that. And of course, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and taking some time out of their schedules this afternoon to talk about what I think is a really unique new product. And CME has, has launched, you know, quite a few number, quite a few micro, new micro, future, micro-sized futures contracts over the last couple of years. And I think the success of a lot of them has been, has been pretty well documented. Um, but this one's unique in that it's not just a smaller version of what already existed. So if you compare it to, you know, a couple of years ago when we launched the micro S&P contract, it was simply a smaller size of the e-mini uh, product that we already had out there. And, and it made a lot of sense because we were answering what we thought was a demand for something less than at the time was $150,000 contract of S&P. Um, and so we created this one-tenth of size, which has actually grown, you know, since then. Um, but it was simply a, a smaller version. The same with the micro Bitcoin and the micro WTI. For the micro treasury yield that we're going to talk about today, not only did we come up with what we thought was a right size product for the individual trader, but we also simplified and I think made more intuitive an interest rate product that you know we think will appeal to the trading public, to the individual trading public. We made it simple, we made it intuitive, and we're going to get into you know the characteristics that you know, I think make it so in this presentation. So with that, let's, let's get started. We also have a disclaimer. I'm, I'm not gonna read it word for word. What I would encourage is, you know, Bastian mentioned that there's a CME sort of uh, educational center on the Trade of Eight website. Go see that or go to the CME Group Institute. It's our educational portal. And I think it's a world-class educational portal where 
we have futures and options information from everywhere that I, I would consider from a 101 level up to a 400 level, you know, depending on your expertise. And, and whether you are a beginner in futures and options or a seasoned vet, I don't think there's anything, you know, there's no such thing as knowing too much. So I would encourage you to go to either one of those two resources where we have a lot of educational material. Uh, this is being recorded. I want to let everybody know that. And, you know, as I've mentioned, and as Bastian mentioned, John Bria, my esteemed colleague, John Bria, I should say, is, is on the line with us today. So if you do have questions as we go along, please feel free to submit them in the chat or in the Q&A section on, on, your Zoom, on your Zoom screen, because we will stop. Um, it's quite possible that I cover a topic and am completely unclear about, you know, what I just said. And, you know, if we see something that needs to be answered in real time, we'll do it. And I think it'll just be a little bit more engaging and dynamic that way. So, like I said, please feel free to submit your questions in real time. So getting started, we're going to go over some just characteristics of the U.S. Treasury and, and debt markets. We're going to go into kind of some of the mechanics there. We're going to talk about, obviously, the new products that we just launched. And then we're going to talk about some use cases and some price history of those new products. And in some cases, relative to some of the products that you might already be familiar with. So the first few slides, and I'm not going to spend a, whole, a, ton, of a ton of time on them because they're really – there to underscore how much money uh, the U.S. and really the globe has printed in the last, you know, call it 18 to 24 months, um, you know, largely in response to the global COVID-19 pandemic. And what I like to compare it to is if you think back, if you were in the markets, and if, even if you weren't in the markets back in 2008, 2009, 2010, we had what you know we referred to at that time as, as the financial crisis that was brought on by the housing you know the housing bubble collapsing and then the mortgage default and, and everything like that. And if you remember back then, we wake up in the morning and we wouldn't know if there was another big investment bank or wirehouse or mortgage servicer that was going to declare bankruptcy. It was a really kind of crazy time in the financial markets. And if you remember, you know, then Secretary of the Treasury Paulson would get up and he would talk about another bailout that was multi-billion dollars. And at the time, those multi-billion dollar, you know, what we call bailout package were, were, were jaw-dropping. We couldn't believe that we were going to print that much money. Well, you fast forward to where we are now, and, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, aside from the trillions we've already spent, uh, we're talking about trillions more in, you know, in the new budget and everything else that's being discussed. So all of a sudden, you know, those billions don't seem like that much money, and we're talking about the T word, the tr trillions. And, and why that's important is because, you know, I kind of, you know, like to think that we might be in the biggest modern monetary theory sort of policy experiment that we've ever seen. You know, it's, it's been well publicized how much money we're spending. And, you know, one possible outcome of that is, is inflation. And, you know, I, I think it's undeniable that we've seen some signs of inflation already. I think what's up for debate, and, and I'm certainly not here to answer that, is, is, is this inf are these inflationary signs that we've seen so far what they call transitory or, or temporary, or is it a sign of sustained, a sustained inflationary environment, in which case, you know, you would expect that yields at the long end of the Treasury curve are going to rise and could rise substantially like we haven't seen in a long time. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I don't think anybody really knows for sure. And, and and it's an ongoing debate if you turn on any of the financial news networks. But if, in fact, we are entering a period of sustained inflation, the long end of the Treasury curve is certainly something I think a market that's worth watching. And, you know, and then, you know, with that volatility, you know, a lot of people would say comes trading opportunity. So the next, you know, this slide in front of you just kind of shows that graphically. You can just sort of see the parabolic, you know, as they say, increase in, in debt and, and Treasury spending. And this one, if you go back to 2000, you know, this sort of narrow band is, is what we were spending or what the debt we had outstanding back then. And you can just see how it's ballooned. And that orange color is the Treasury securities within the global debt market, which is obviously a big chunk of it. Those are U.S. Treasury securities. Um, and then the same thing here. That's, you know, where this slide was uh, the outstanding debt and this side is the issue. And so both kind of the same story. The, the spending has exploded. And like I said, the implications are unknown. Um, but if, in fact, it turns out that it has an inflationary impact, you know, you would expect uh, most most economists, I think, would expect that the Treasury yields at the long end are going to move and could move, like I said, fairly substantially. So this is kind of like, why does it matter, right? This slide here, and you hear it a lot. Um, this is uh, the, the sort of 30-year mortgage rate plotted against the 10-year treasury yield. And you know, obviously, I think the correlation bet between the two on this graph is, is pretty obvious. And it's probably not something that a lot of people haven't heard. 
So, you know, right away, you know, I would say, well, of course, the, the yield impacts almost everybody, whether you own a house or trying to buy a house. And unless you're paying for it in full in cash, you, you know, generally a lot of people take out a mortgage. And, you know, this graph shows you how correlated those two things are. But I think it's actually a little bit deeper than that. You know, what, you know when, when you think about how big the global interest rate market is and, and really the U.S. Treasury market by many measures is the biggest interest rate market in the world, um, and, and the ability that it has to impact so many different assets, I think that's where it becomes such an interesting market to watch, if not trade. You know, when you, when you think about, you know, equities, for example, the, the, the prevailing interest rate is going to affect equities um, in that if, if rates are low, quite simply, companies can borrow at a lower rate, right, which theoretically makes them more profitable. But even beyond that, if, if interest rates are really low, it can make equities, it can make equities look more attractive just in the, in the fact that, you know, the return is more. And that's sort of when you, you know, discount cash flows and everything like that, everything like that when you value a stock, the lower the interest rate, you know, the, the easier it is to get over that sort of low bar, the higher the interest rate goes, you know, it's harder to get over that sort of break even bar when you value an equity. So, you know, that, those are just two obvious ways that rates can impact equities. We know that rates can impact foreign currencies, right? We've seen a lot of times when we'll see a spike in interest rates and then the dollar will rally against, you know, major currencies because people are buying dollars to buy treasuries, for example, as the yield goes up, you know, quite simply. And, and there's a lot of dynamics that go into all of this. I'm just kind of pointing out a few of them. And of course, gold and, and interest rates has a relationship going back in history. So, you know, my opinion is if you're trading any of these other asset classes, you're in a way, you're sort of trading interest rates already. It's just kind of built into the price. So why not at least be watching the interest rates? And these new products make it very easy to do that. So these are just real, real quick, some, some characteristics of the U.S. Treasury market. The U.S. Uh, Treasury issues T-bills, which you know, are, have maturities up to one year, and then notes, which are two, three, five, seven, 10 years. And then bonds, which are 10 and, and, and 30 years. The one big difference between bills and then the notes and bonds is that bills are what we call a zero coupon um, bearing instrument, which means if you're lending the government $100, and, say, and, and again, if, if you're buying treasuries, you're essentially lending the U.S. government money. So if you're lending the government $100, let's say, in the form of a T-bill, you know, you essentially pay something less than $100 and you get $100 back. And there's an implied yield within that. Um, whereas if you're buying notes or bonds, you're going to pay that hundred dollars and then you're going to get some sort of coupon payment every six months for the duration of that note or bond, which is what we mean by a coupon. So just, you know, just a, a very, you know, quick description of what the difference between those two things is. And we're going to get into the pricing and yields and stuff like that. And that's one of the big differences of this product versus what we've had available before. And again, real quick, the U.S. Treasury market is, is sort of kind of split into the primary market, which are essentially counterparties to the New York Fed. But essentially, when the U.S. Treasury auctions new notes and bonds, they do it through the, what we call the primary market. And that's a strictly institutional market made up really kind of a handful of, of, of institutions um, that you know, have qualified to be part of this, quote, primary market. And then the secondary market, which, like anything else, is sort of once these uh, debt instruments have been issued, they trade in what we call the secondary market. And the one that we have up in front of you called BrokerTech is, is a platform that the CME Group actually owns now with their acquisition of the next company a couple of years ago. One of the um, platforms, almost I would almost call it an exchange, it's not an exchange, uh, but one of the platforms on which you can trade cash gover U.S. government bonds is BrokerTech and is a CME Group owned con uh, company. And incidentally, we're going to get into, we're actually using broker tech prices for these new instruments. So the reason that we're all here is to talk about the new futures products. So the maturities that we are tenors, if a, lot of, a lot of times you hear the word tenor, the tenors that we have available are the two-year, the five-year, the 10-year, and the 30-year. Now, a couple characteristics of these new futures products. One that's important is that they're cash settled which means that when that contract expires on the last day of the trading month, it settles in a cash transaction and you don't have an obligation to neither make or take delivery of actual U.S. government securities. So essentially we just move the money and you wind up flat. 
so you no longer have a position if you hold the futures contract until expiration. So that's an important distinction between that and the traditional treasuries that CME has offered, which are physically delivered. And if you hold those to maturity, you actually have an obligation to make delivery or take delivery of actual U.S. government debt. Um, these are quoted in yield. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But what that means is instead of quoting a note or a bond in a price, which might look something like 104 and 532nd, we're actually going to quote the yield. If you pull up your trading screen, the bid offer is going to be in the form of a yield. So in the 10 year, it might look something, I think it's like 1.3 ish or something right now. It's going to look something like 1.300 bid at 1.301. So right there, you don't have to do any conversions of a price into yield. You know, if you pull up any financial news network on television, it's going to be the yield. Um, the contract size, we made it uniform. So whether you're trading the two year or the 30 year, every time of the, the price of one of these instruments moves by one basis point, which is 0 0.01 of a percent, it's worth $10. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a two year, the five year or the 30 year, it's $10, which makes, which incidentally makes spreading these contracts. We're going to get into that a little bit, a lot more sort of intuitive and streamlined. And then the tick size is actually one tenth of one basis point. So it's that third decimal that I just mentioned. So again, if you're looking at your screen, you might see a bid of one point, you know, like I just said, three zero zero at one point three zero one. Well, that one at the end is one tenth of one basis point. So that's a one dollar bid offer, which you know is essentially what we've seen um, since we launched these things in the ten year. Is the market has been that one tenth of a basis point wide, which it's a very, what we would consider very tight and efficient market. And that's important um, because when, when markets get illiquid and the bid offer widens out, that's a trading cost. And it's not an explicit one like a commission, but sometimes it can dwarf a, a commission cost if, you know, if you're looking at illiquid products. Uh, we always have two contracts available. So right now we would have the September and the October available. And then, like I said before, it terminates or the contract expires on the last business day of every month. So one of the concepts um, in futures that's different than in cash equities is the concept of margin. So and the way I like to describe it is if you're trading, let's say, stocks on margin through some broker, that margin that, you know, you're, you're essentially borrowing from the broker is, is a cost that gets, you know, that you pay interest on. It's essentially a loan from a broker. Whereas in futures, when we say margin, it's simply what I would call a performance bond. So it's essentially money that you put up with, say, trade of eight in order to hold a position overnight. So you can see that uh, for these products, um, the, the margin ranges from 120 to $200. And that's based on the volatility. You, you know, statistically, you would expect the 30 years to be more volatile than the two years. So the margin's a little bit higher. But regardless, we always say that futures are a very capital efficient way to deploy your money. Um, because essentially, you know, the way I would kind of think about the value of these contracts it's kind of the price, which in the 10 year, I think it's around 1.3 1, 1 right now. Um, I could be off by a few basis points on that. But on the 10 year, I would say it's, it's kind of 1.3 times 1,000. So you're essentially getting $1,300 worth of 10 year, if you will. And for that, you're putting down $175. So, you know, another way to say that, um, admittedly, is leverage, right? These, these futures offer inherent leverage. But I, you know, I think a better way to look at it is it's, it's a very efficient way to deploy your capital. And, you know, I think whether you're an individual trader or a bank or a hedge fund, you know, everyone has capital constraints. So that's an important consideration. So here's just a, a real quick example of kind of price versus yield. So when we did this slide, and I think there's been another 10-year um, note that's been issued since then, but when we did this, the on the run, and that's important, I'm going to get into that in a second. The on the run 10 year note was what we would refer to as the 1.625 of May of May 15th of 31. So essentially, the 10 year note that we would consider on the run, which is really just simply the most recently issued US 10 year note, was a 10 year note that, exp that matured or expired, if you will, matured on May 15th, 2031. And the coupon on that note was 1.625, which meant that if you bought that note at par value, let's say it's 100 even, 
you know, you would essentially receive half of 1.625 every six months as a coupon payment until that 10 year note matured. Now on July 13th, the price of that was 101. This is what I was saying before it was 101 and 29 and one fourth 30 seconds. Well, that's not real intuitive, right? At that time, the yield on that note and what you might have seen if you turned on any of the financial news networks as they flash across the screen was the 10-year note is yielding 1.415. In this case, we went out a de another decimal, but essentially what you'd see on, on TV is maybe the yield is 1.42 or something like that. A much more intuitive way, I think, to look at what you're actually trading. Now, just real quick and, and just to describe why price and yield move inversely to one another. So you can see when this note was issued, it was paying a coupon of 1.625. Now, and, and, and that was theoretically at par value of 100. Now, since then, the sort of, um, the sort of uh, general interest rate environment has gone down, as you can see by the fact that the yield's gone down. Well, if you had a note that was paying you 1.625 and you look to sell it, you wouldn't sell it for the hundred that you paid for it because it's worth more, right? It's, it's the coupon payment is more than the general, you know, yield right now. 1.62 is more than 1.42. So the price goes up. So if you were buying that note, you'd actually pay over that par value. And then that would make essentially that would, you know, you would drive the yield from that and the yield would be lower. So that's why I hope that was a little bit, you know, not too muddy of an explanation, but that's why prices and yields move inversely to one another. And here's just a screenshot um, you can see on the bottom here. We took this on August 23rd, and this is CME groups uh, provided uh, trading front end um, call, that we call CME direct. And, that, you know, we just, we just snapped this, you know, at 9.05 on, on that morning. But it's a, it's a picture of what the micro tenure looked at looked like at that time. So you can see that at that time, the bid offer was 1.264 at 1.265. So again, that third decimal, that four, you know, that, you know, four bid at five, if you will, represents $1. Because again, a basis point is 0 0.01 of a percent. So the number in general represents 1.264%. The two six, you know, the 0 0.01 is your basis point, and then that third decimal is essentially one tenth of one basis point, or in other words, you know, in dollar terms, a one dollar bid offer. And again, that's an important consideration when you're trading this stuff. The fact that the market is, you know, what we call the smallest bid offer that it can be, that 0 0.001 increment. And then you can see just incidentally the quantity on both sides is 660 at 335. So, you know, there's more than enough size for most people. Um, I think to transact um, on the bid and the offer there. So this is just kind of a quick example of, of what that means. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, let's say the five year here on June 29th of 21, theoretically was priced at, you know, 0.891 was, was essentially the yield or the price on that date. And then on June 30th, which was the day that this contract would theoretically have expired. Now, obviously we didn't have them at the time, but theoretically, let's say the yield had gone down to 0.872. Well, the difference, again, is essentially one basis point. Well, it's essentially 1.9 basis points. So, again, one basis point is worth $10, and then that 0.9 would be another nine. So, the difference there, you know, your sort of P&L difference would have been $19. So, if you held, you know, if you, um, let's say you sold this, five year on June 29th at 0.891 and then you let it expire and it settled to 0.872, you know, you, you're essentially your account would be credited the $19. Now you might say, I don't want it to expire. I want to, you know, I want to maintain my short position in the five year because I think that it's going to, the yield going to keep going down. Well, if, and, and, and if you're really familiar with futures, I apologize. This is a little bit of review, but if you want to maintain a futures position that you're holding through expiration, you simply do what we call in futures is, is a simple spread or a roll. So essentially what you would do if you were holding the June, let's say in this case, and you wanted to roll it to July, if you were short the June, you would simply buy June and you would sell July. So buying June would make you flat the June contract and it would make you short 
uh, I'm sorry, buying the Jew back would make you flat the June contract. Selling July then would sort of roll that position, if you will, into the July and you'd be short July and you would maintain that, that short exposure. And I'm not going to get into this graph too much, but it kind of shows this is the traditional 10-year note future. We use that because we don't have historical data on these new micro yield contracts. But this just shows like the dark blue line on the, on the left side of your screen is the March. And again, the traditional treasuries are quarterly contracts, so March, June, and, and September and December. It shows, you know, at the beginning of this year in January, all, you know, most all of the volume in the 10-year was in that next expiring contract, the March, that, that sort of dark blue line. But then sort of towards the very end of February, you see the volume drop dramatically in March and pick up in the June, that, you know, the next sort of darker or medium, I guess, shaded blue color there. And that's just simply people rolling that position. So the March contract rolls off. And then the June contract kind of picks up and then you see the volume, you know, for the next three months in June and then it rolls into set. So let's go over just a couple of really, really basic kind of P&L examples with these new yield contracts. In this case, we have a hypothetical trader that expects um, that we're going to get a higher inflation news and maybe it's like the CPI. Um, and this trader thinks that this high CPI number is going to make the yield in the 10 year in the ten or the yield in the ten year note increase, right? So they basically buy one contract, you know, again theoretically, of the new ten year yield contract. And at the time the price was one point three five. Now let's assume for a second that the CPI number comes out, it's released, it's higher, and the yields do in fact rise like this trader thought they would. And in fact the the yield rises to one point four five. So essentially the yield's gone from one 0.35% to 1.452%. Well, if you do the simple math there, that's 10.2 basis points. And again, one basis point is $10, 0.2, you know, and the 0.2 is $2. So essentially the P&L in this hypothetical trade would have been $102. Because we want to be fair, not every trade's a winner. We did kind of the opposite trade where, you know, the, the trader thought that the yield was going to go higher, but the number comes out, it's lower, the yield falls. This trader had bought the yield again at the same price, but in this case, the, the yield fell to 1.297. Again, very simple math. It was 5.3 basis points for a $53, you know, hit to your P&L, if you will. So we just wanted to show this, you know, very quickly to, to kind of to give an idea of, you know, how these things are priced, the increments in which they move, and, and, and again, then what that means to your P&L in dollar terms. So we wanted to show that a few historical price movement graphs because, you know, based on, you know, recent history, it looks like, you know, the, if, if we come up with theoretical dollar moves in these new micro yield contracts, they're fairly different than some of these other products that you might be familiar with. Now, a couple caveats here. Um, for the 10-year yield, we took data from the St. Louis Fed um, website called FRED, um, because we simply didn't have historical data, obviously, on the product that we just launched a couple weeks ago. So we essentially took the closing 10-year um, yield as published by the St. Louis Fed in order to get a proxy for what the 10-year you know, yield contract would have been. So it's not exact, but I think it's a pretty good proxy. And then, what, and then beyond that, so we, we essentially just took daily closing prices. So these are close-to-close -close prices for the last five years. So you can see if you take the price from close to close in the micro equities, the micro crude and the micro gold versus that of the micro, you know, theoretical micro tenure, you can see how substantially different and how much you know, more over the last five years those other products have moved relative to the tenure. On average, the close to close dollar difference in the micro tenure, $31 versus you know, at, the, at the top end, 153 on the micro NASDAQ. So a pretty substantial difference on a close to close basis. And then if you look at just kind of a couple of the other metrics we looked at, you know, the number of days that that sort of close to close difference was over 50, a lot more in, you know, in those products other than the 10 year, you know, the, the number of days over $200 close to close only three times out of 1,257 days did that 10 year move over $200. And then, you know, you can see the daily max changes that we observed over those five years. Now, I want to be emphatic here, as with any financial investment or, 
you know, trade that you're looking at, you know, again, it's that standard just because it happened in, in the past doesn't mean it's going to happen in the future, but this is what has happened in the, fa in the past. And I think that's, that's worth looking at. And this is just a graphical way to look at that. It, it's the dollar change in the 10 year versus the dollar change in the micro NASDAQ, uh, the, the NASDAQ being in blue. And you can see, especially in, you know, in the last four years, how dramatically more on a, on a you know, daily price change basis that micro NASDAQ has moved versus the theoretical micro tenure. And this is another way to look at it, um, but instead of doing dollar terms, we simply took the yield and the price of the, uh, well, we have the E-mini, but you, know, you would expect that the micro E-mini would have been the same, you know, same closing price. So you can just see how, I think this one's interesting because even though that dollar amount has been much more on a daily basis for the you know the e mini versus the ten year the graph looked to me pretty different right the the blue line is you know five years of price data of the s p five hundred essentially it's kind of a, a fairly straight line obviously with you know with with the break that occurred um, last March when we had economic sh shutdowns because of the pandemic. It's been a fairly steady kind of upward slope where, you know, there's a little bit more back and forth in that 10-year yield. So while the price, you know, the dollar in terms of dollars uh, of the micro yield has been a lot less, the graphs are pretty different. Um, and, and again, I'm not here to prognosticate on, you know, what's going to happen or what that means. I'm, in fact, I'm not allowed to as a CME employee, but I wanted to point out the differences in, in, in the graphs. And this one I thought was interesting. So we, we essentially did a, a hypothetical P&L for five years where we assumed a short position at the end of July 2016. And simply, we took a short position in the micro S&P, which is the, um, the blue line, a short position in the micro crude, which is the gray line, and then a short position in the yield, uh, again, theoretical, uh, which is the orange line, and just kind of let it run for five years. And the reason I wanted to show this is to show kind of the variability around the sort of unchanged P&L mark, which is kind of where we start there on, you know, on the left side of the graph. You can see, you know, obviously we know how much stocks have appreciated over the last five years, and that's why the blue line goes down so dramatically. But even within that, you see a lot more variability around that sort of zero P&L in both the S&P and the micro crude than you do in the micro yield where it seems to hover a little bit more around that, that sort of flat line on your P&L. Again, I, I need to be emphatic that this is history. It doesn't mean that's what's going to happen, but I, you know, I think it's always worth looking at what has happened. And just real quick, you know, implied volatility, we could, we could spend an entire webinar on implied volatility, but essentially it's the, it's the option market's measure of how much the futures price is going to move over a given time period. So it's essentially the magnitude of price movement the options market is pricing in. I just wanted to show this real quick. And again, we use the traditional 10-year options because we don't have options on the new micros at this time. Um, so we use the, the traditional 10 years of proxy, which is that dotted red line. And you can see how dramatically lower the implied volatility has been over the last, you know, call it six months, or actually I think it's a year here, um, in the 10 year versus the S and P, the NASDAQ, the WTI and gold. Um, you know, I think it's this, this graph kind of underscores that point. And then finally, before we get into our last P and L example, I want to, this, these are just hypothetical um, yields. There's no history here. It's just, I just drew these out to kind of show different yield curve, yield curve shifts. And the reason we wanted to show this is because a lot of professional interest rate traders don't necessarily trade just the 10 year and trade whether the 10 year is gonna go up or down. A lot of professional interest traders might trade that way, but they'll also trade, what's the 10 year yield gonna do relative to the two year? Or what's the 10 year gonna do relative to the 30 year? And, and there are a lot of permutations within that. So in other words, they're trading not just the move of the yield curve, but the shape of the yield curve. And that's what I wanted to show graphically here. So we just took a baseline normal yield curve, which is that, sort of black dotted line there. And then we, we took a situation where the yield curve does what we call a flattening move, which means that the yield of the longer term instruments gets closer to the yield of the shorter term instruments. 
And you can see that in that sort of darker blue color um, on the bottom of the graph. So essentially what's happened there is the two year has stayed relatively steady where the yield on the 30 year has come way down. So a flat, what we call a flattening yield curve. Now a dramatic example of that is when the yield curve flattened so much that it actually inverts, which happened a couple, couple falls ago. I think it was the October of 2019, where we saw the 10 year yield actually go below the yield of the two year, which is important because in history, and it didn't happen during that occurrence, but in history, a lot of times when the yield curve inverts and the 10 year yield less than the two year, two year yield, it portends a, a, a recession. Now, again, the recession didn't follow that occurrence of it, but it's a, it's a measure that a lot of people watch. Now, the yellow line is the opposite. In the yellow line, the yield curve did what we call a steepening move, where the longer term yield rose more than the shorter term yield. And so the graph kind of, you know, essentially steepened, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and again, that's just another way, you know, if you think that you know, the longer term inflation expectations are going to outpace, you know, the, the sort of moves at the short end, you would think that the long and interest rate uh, yields are going to move more and, you know, it would be a steepening trade. And then that light blue line is essentially where the yield curve, the entire yield curve sort of shifts in parallel. So kind of like an increase in interest rates across the board. Um, so just wanted to show that graphically because I think it's important and I think you know, looking at interest rates as a spread transaction is, is a very interesting way to look at these markets. So in this case, we, we sort of set up the same kind of hypothetical trade example as we did before, except we did a spread trade. So in this case, it says the trader anticipates the slope of the yield curve to steepen. So again, this trader is assuming that the long end yields are going to move or going to go higher more than the short end is going to go higher. So we essentially put on a trade, a hypothetical trade based on that. And again, because all of these instruments, all of these micro yield futures contracts have a consistent basis point value of $10, you don't have to worry about the spread ratio. You don't have to worry about buying more two years than 10 years or anything like that, like you would with the traditional um, uh, treasury products that the CME has always had. Because it's just $10, whether it's a two-year or a 10-year, it's a, essentially a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, you could change that if you wanted, um, but you don't have to in this case. So in this case, we're going to put on a steepening trade, which means we're going to sell that short end, right? We're going to sell the two-year and hypothetically at a, you know, a price of 0.221%. We're going to buy one of those 10 years at 1.342% for a difference of 1.121, right? So that's what the difference between the twos and the tens was when we put on this hypothetical trade. So in, in, again, we set this up obviously to make money. This is all hypothetical and theoretical, but again, so you can see the entry point at that 1.121. And in our example, the two year went up by just under one basis point. So 0.9 really of a basis point. Whereas the 10 year went up by, what do we say here? 18.5, 18 and a half basis points. So while we lost point uh, 0.9 of one basis point on the two-year leg of this trade, we made 18.5 basis points on the 10-year because, again, the 10-year yield increased relatively more than the two-year did. And that was the trade that we were putting on. So if you add those two legs up together, you know, 185 on the 10-year minus the nine that you, $9 that you lost on the two-year comes up with that 176 um, credit to your, to your P&L. And we, so again, just to kind of show, so again, this is that two versus tens trade. We added one sort of data element to the same graph that we just looked at. So again, we, we sort of did a hypothetical P and L of the short, uh, in this case, we did the micro NASDAQ. Um, we did the short two year and then the short 10 year. And then we did the actual spread, which is that orange graph. So. Um, I'm sorry, we did, we did a hypothetical short two year and then a hypothetical long 10 year, and then we combined them with that orange line. So again, you can see that spreading it takes even more variability around that sort of zero P and L mark out of the trade, right? You can see that the, the NASDAQ obviously dwarfs the, the treasury um, price moves, but then even the spread within you know, what we did with the two legs again, takes more volatility, more variability out of it.
So I just thought that was an, an interesting way to look at, you know, the, the hypothetical P&L on the stack versus the legs of, of a yield and then versus the spread itself. Craig, quickly on the, on the on the topic yeah. of spreading. Sorry, just yeah. wanted to jump in real quick. Is there a margin offset that we're offering if you're spreading in between the tenors? There is, and, and it, it you know, and it, it's sort of um, it's a good question, and it's kind of highlighted by this slide. So, as you take you know theoretical volatility out of the trade, the CME is going to offer margin offsets on those. So it, that's a very good point. It's not just adding up the two legs for margin, and and, I, and quite frankly, Jen, I don't know off the top of my head what those offsets are, but there yeah. you know there would be offsets if you have a spread on. It's a good question. And another thing to point out is that in, in many of these markets, you can transact these as a spread. So you don't have to necessarily what we call leg into a spread. The CME offers spread markets on there. So you can transact that in one efficient, uh, in one efficient trade or one efficient transaction. Perfect. So yeah. I'm not going to get into what's actually on the screen as much as um, point out the fact that on CME Group, um, dot com on our website, there are um, kind of two two things I want to point out. One is just a general suite of tools that we have available called Quick Strike, and that's Q U I K, so it's quick without a C, um, and it's a third party with whom we've we've contracted. And through the Quick Strike, so if you Google cmgroup.com slash Quick Strike, um, it'll bring you to the suite of tools, and it's it's a lot of options functionality. But I would contend that, you know, the functionality that we have out there in terms of historical implied volatility, option pricing, um, theoretical stuff, is probably tantamount to what would have been, you know, thousands of dollars worth of software just 15 or 20 years ago. And it's out there for free. So even if you're not trading options, there's a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge to be gained by knowing what's happening in the options markets. Because, again, going back to that implied volatility, Applied volatility tells you the movement that the options market is pricing into the futures. So I'd encourage everyone to check out QuickStrike. And then within QuickStrike suite of tools, there's a subset called Treasury Analytics. And this is just a, an excerpt from that. There's a ton of information on, on the Treasury markets and the interest rate markets in general. And you can dig into it and kind of go, go down a pretty, pretty deep rabbit hole if you want. But there's a ton of information that I would encourage everybody to check out that Treasury Analytics uh, section of the website. And then finally, we're at the Q&A. Um, and again, uh, this is the CME Institute. It's cmegroup.com slash, slash education. So like I said at the onset, I would encourage everybody, again, whether you're a seasoned vet or, or a brand new futures trader, go to either our educational portal or the one at Tradevate because I think they're both world-class and, and I think there's something for everybody. So with that, I think we've got time for some questions, if there are any. Um, John, you feel free to jump in as well. Great job, Craig. There's a, the chat and the Q&A have been relatively quiet, but there was one that just came in. Um, do we offer exchange traded spreads for these micros? Yes, there are. So, yeah. and, and it's actually an important, it, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, back it, it's, it's actually a, it, it, it's actually an important point, especially when we go back to what I was talking about with the role. Um, so if if for example you're long the ten year yield and you want to maintain that long position through expiration, so you know it gets down to the last week of the month and it's going to expire on say a Thursday. But you want to maintain that long position and roll it into the next month. So let's say it's this month, it's September, and you want to maintain that into October. You're essentially going to sell that September contract and buy the October, which, again, is going to get you flat in September. You won't have a position, and then you'll have a long position in October that maintains your sort of long view. You don't have to do two different transactions. You don't have to sell the SEP and buy the October. If you go to the, you know, your trade of eight front end or CME group, there's actually listed spreads so that you can do that at a differential in one, again, in one efficient transaction. So it's an important point, not just for spreading, but also um, if you're if you're trying to roll a position, which you know, rolling position really is is nothing more than a calendar spread anyway. 
Um, but that's an important point to make. Great. And then there was one question that just came in. I think uh, this is directed toward Bastion. What are the tickers on Tradeabate's platform for these new micro contracts? Right. Yes. So that's a good question. And the the tickers actually, the CME did a good job, I find, um, on, on these. They're very easy to remember. So the like the 10 year, the micro 10 year is the 10 Y, the so one zero Y. The two year is the two Y Y. 30 year is the 30 Y. And then the five year is the five Y Y. So it's it's easy to um, to find those in trade of eight. Just type in those symbols and uh, you'll find the uh, the, the various expiration months, and you can select the the one that's obviously the most liquid, uh, and and uh, you'll be able to find those that way. Uh, if you go to our website and just look at the margins page, we have them listed there as well, just like all the other contracts that we offer. Great. And then another question coming in, are these available to trade on Tradebase platform currently? Yes, they are. They are available. And the, the nice thing too about these is their micro contracts are just like most of the other micros that we offer. They have a $55 day margin. So they're pretty easy to trade with a, even with a smaller account. And they, uh, they have lower commissions as well. So they're treated as the other micros. So it's a 25 cent commission. So they're really pretty affordable to trade and paired with what Craig was saying before, they're, they're easier to trade than say the bigger uh, treasuries just because of the fact that the way they're, the way they're quoted and the fact that they're not physically settled. So definitely some advantages trading those micro yield uh, futures. Oh, and, and one thing, they're on the CBOT, right? So they, they need, you'd need CBOT market data for these. Great, I think we have one more for Craig here. Craig, you went over tools and resources. Are there any economic reports and or indicators to be cognizant of when trading these micro treasuries? There are, you know, so obviously some of the ones that you'd wanna watch are, you know, anything that's gonna sort of prompt inflationary sort of warnings, which is CPI and PPI and things like that. And, and lately, I think, I think Pretty much everybody would assume that the jobs report could impact this, right? Because a stronger economy could lead to, you know, theoretically could lead to uh, an FOMC type of move or, or, you know, probably more likely what, what the Fed has, has sort of indicated lately, the, the whole, are they going to taper or not? So, you know, so those are some, some obvious ones. But what, again, what I would actually suggest as an answer to that question is, if, again, if you go to that CME group, uh, like, I, I actually wish I should know it off the top of my head. I don't know what the, the URL to the Quick Strike homepage is, but if you Google CME Group uh, Quick Strike, it'll bring you to the Quick Strike homepage. And one of the you know one of the functionality um, pieces out there is actually an economic um, impact calendar. Right? I'm, I'm butchering the name a little bit, but we actually have consolidated those reports into a calendar such that you can pick an asset class, for example, interest rates, and it's going to show you a calendar of relevant economic uh, reports and events that are happening. So again, I, you know, I, I don't think I can be too emphatic that there's a ton of resources at that quick strike, um, that quick strike webpage. And, you know, one of them is, is actually would, would answer this question kind of perfectly. Great. All right. Thanks, Craig. I'm going to kick it back over to Bastion. I think that uh, exhausts the chat and the, the Q&A uh, questions. Yes, exactly. Th thank you so much for, for answering those questions. I think that was um, overall very helpful, the, the presentation, because I think a lot of traders might have a feeling that these uh, these treasuries in general are, are more complicated to trade compared to, say, the, the indices or, or the commodities like oil and gold. So I think the explanation and some, some insight on how to, uh, how to trade these has been 
very, very useful. So uh, I definitely appreciate the, the clarity on that. And uh, lastly, just um, there is a, I'm just sharing this page here now. There is a, uh, a website. If you go to info.tradeofaid.com slash micro treasury futures, that will take you to a, uh, a dedicated website that has information on on these micro treasuries. So things like the the symbols, the the tick size, things that were discussed in the in the webinar. But it just gives you some some of those useful uh, useful information on on these contracts. And obviously, you can pull them up in Trade of Eight and uh, use the demo account to to play some trades on those and see how how they how they trade on the demo. So yeah, definitely uh, very very useful and informative webinar on these. And we, we definitely hope that they will be as successful as the other micro contracts that the CME has, has recently launched. So definitely optimistic about that. Um, well, I think that's all the questions I can see here now. So definitely thank you, uh, Craig and, and John too, for the presentation and for, for the, uh, the Q&A as well. And uh, if any questions come up on these contracts or anything in uh, anything else for that matter, feel free to reach out to Tradevate. You can just uh, email us or give us a call, use the, the chat within the platform. So we're always glad to help answer any questions. So thanks, thanks uh, everybody for joining and uh, you too, Craig and John, for taking the time. And thank you guys. Thank, thanks to Tradevate and thanks to everybody. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll catch you again on the next webinar. All right. Bye-bye.